Hello everybody, it's your old pal Tuna back with another video. If you don't know me, yes, my name is Tuna. I am a full-time illustrator and comic artist. I have almost 100,000 followers on Instagram and I've been doing what I do for over 10 years now. Now, we have been getting to know each other here on YouTube for the past few months and I've been enjoying every minute of it, but I figured it was about time that I catch you up to where I am now. As I mentioned, I have been doing this for 10 years, so there is a lot to go over. And I always get tons of questions about how I became a full-timer, how I get work, stuff like that. So I thought it would be fun if we went through the past 10 years of my career and hopefully I can impart some wisdom as to how you can build your own creative business. So yesterday I spent all day, basically, I mean, it was a few hours, let's be real, but I spent all day collecting art from the past 15 years of my life. And I figured we could take a look at some of that art and while I talk about all the stuff that I've done. I will also be doing a short Q&A at the end of the video with the questions that I got over on Instagram. So, you know, continue to watch until the end. Thank you for joining me here and I hope that you find this informative or interesting or entertaining. I am mostly just gonna be talking, so if you don't wanna see my old art, you can do this podcast style. I won't be mad. Let's jump right into it. Okay, we won't spend too long here, but I did wanna catch you up on like me as a child. I'm one of those people who's been drawing since as long as I can remember. I've also kept so much of that old art, but I'll spare you the really old stuff. We'll jump right into kind of like around when I was realizing that art was the thing that I was gonna do with the rest of my life. And I realized this through being a member of an online community called Gaia Online. Many of you elder millennials are probably thinking, oh my God, I haven't heard that name in years. And through hanging out in the art shops there, I learned all about taking commissions and creating art for other people. I honestly credit this time for giving me a lot of skills that I ended up using throughout the following 15 years because you learn how to communicate with people, you learn how to take revisions, you kind of learn how to separate your ego from the production of the art. But like, don't get me wrong, I don't think this is spectacular art in any way. Obviously, I still had so much growing to do. But another benefit to learning and like getting into art this way is that I have been sharing my work online from a very, very young age. And being surrounded by other people who were on that same creative path online was really helpful in terms of having like a community and people to talk to and people to grow alongside. I think these days it's a lot easier because we have things like social media didn't exist back then. But I really feel if you've got a thick enough skin to be able to share your stuff online, or if you're thin, you're thin. If your skin is a little bit thin, it will thicken while you post and you get, I mean, any sort of feedback is good feedback. You don't need to be like, I'm gonna get thousands of notes or reblogs. I've been thinking a lot about Tumblr, so apparently that's where my brain is at right now. Retweets and likes. It's not as much about that as it is learning to share your work and be less nervous about that, really. But speaking of which, let's move on to the next phase. This is my post high school era. And during this time, I was not working full time as an artist. I knew after I graduated high school that I wasn't really good at anything else. I didn't really have any other interests. And I figured, okay, well, I guess, I guess this is my life path. I guess I better figure this out. And I'm really lucky. I have parents who are supportive and have always been supportive of me creatively and like, turning that into a business. After sharing my work on Gaia, this next step that I took was to basically become a user of Tumblr. And thank you Tumblr for turning me into the person that I am today as well, for better or for worse. But I spent so much time there, again, finding community, finding connections with people who were doing similar things, exploring fandom a little bit, but the main thing was continuing to share my work online. And now instead of sharing my work in a way where I was always kind of being transactional with the people that I was sharing it with. This was me just being able to put stuff out into the world and get feedback. Granted, I was still monetizing it. The hustle began at a very young age. I would take personal commissions there for literally like 25 to $50 a pop. And I was getting bites from people online who, you know, it's pocket change when you're in your late teens and early 20s, $25, treat yourself to a little custom art. And I was also able to reach some of my friends in real life and my family members, people who were aware of what it was that I was doing and honestly probably just wanted to support me. So thanks for that, people. I don't really think that you need a lot of supporters to start getting work as an illustrator. I mean, at this point I had maybe a couple hundred followers on Tumblr and you know, my 200 friends on Facebook. My only word of wisdom at this point is if you do wanna start taking commissions while you're really, really green, don't do them for 25 to $50. Choose a rate that's fair for you and that people are willing to pay. 
But anyway, this is around the time that I decided to go to college for art. Um, I wasn't really sure if this was something that was right for me, but I figured I would give it a try. I like to joke that I'm a two-time art college dropout because it's true. I lasted one sem- not even one semester actually, at the first program that I was in, which was a diploma program that was th for three years for illustration and design. And the second program was just kind of like a adult education evening classes for illustration. I don't have anything against art school, and I think that if you're the type of person who thrives in that environment, like power to you, go get your education on. But it was very time consuming. It was like all day classes. It was very expensive. And I was already making money as an illustrator, not an exceptionally great illustrator, but I was making money as an illustrator at this point. And I was kind of at the top of my class. Again, not stroking my ego, just saying when you sit in a round table of your peers and you're getting feedback and everyone's like, we love it. You know, it doesn't feel like I'm getting a lot out of the experience. One of the big things I took away from it was the connections that I made, whether that was with my um, educators or my classmates. I met my best friend in art school. He also dropped out in the following semester. And I think in hindsight, I do wish that I had stayed the course because the first year was for illustration, the second year was for design, and then the third year was kind of a little bit of both. And I'm not the strongest designer in the world. I really feel that if I had learned some of those fundamentals in that second year. I probably would appreciate that around now. During that time, I was doing a lot of different things as well, not just going to school. First of all, I was working as a barista. That was like my, that was my job until I was able to switch to full time. And once I became like, I was basically running the cafe and I was like, I'm making $12 an hour. This, I think I've hit the ceiling for this industry. It's time to figure out how to take things further from here. And one of the things that I got was an opportunity to show at a gallery show at one of the independent galleries here in Vancouver. It's called the Beaumont Studios. And the way that I got this gallery show was that I would go and take my like laptop computer and external tablet and I would go to cafes and work there and draw. And through doing that, people would be interested in what I was doing. I struck up a conversation with this person who put me in touch with the Beaumont Studios and it never really led to anything, that particular event, but still cool to have on my shelf. That was on my resume for a long time. I was proud of that. And I think that this was right before I started college, but I was actually working on a web comic called Butterpaws in Caddyland. I still like live for the story and hopefully one day I'll get a chance to revisit it again because I only managed to do like maybe 20 pages. It was part of building my portfolio as a comics creator because I think deep down I always knew that comics were something that I was interested in. And I've been making comics since I was like a, a small child. Also around this time was when I started to get interested in doing conventions. I'd been attending them as like a cosplayer and just an attendee for years. So I'd seen the artist alley. I knew what people were up to and I thought, hey, I could do that. So I applied for a few. The first one that I got into, it was like $50 for a half of a table. I probably spent $50 on printing prints and then some stickers on these big sheets and I would hand cut them all by myself. I spent maybe a hundred dollars and I didn't make that money back at my first show. My second one was more successful though. So I, I held out and it was worthwhile. I was doing mostly fan art, which is another kind of piece of advice if you wanna write this one down. Fan art is a really great way to get eyes on you, especially when you're a young artist and you're trying to build up your audience and get people interested in what you're doing. By having fan art, in your portfolio and at your table or on your website, you can kind of signal to the types of people that you want to attract to your work because if you're making fan art of it, your art style might be something that people who are fans of that thing would be a fan of. And yes, there are some legal questions regarding exactly how okay it is to sell fan art, but that is not what we're talking about today. Also during this period, I was trying to find work. So, up until this point, most of what I had been doing was friends and family, uh, small time Tumblr commissions, personal commissions. But I did decide that I wanted to try and find work, like actual client work. And the only way that I knew how to do this was to go on Craigslist. Now, I, I think that this is old advice and I wouldn't necessarily recommend you do this now, but back then a lot of people would post gigs, creative gigs on Craigslist, as well as um, larger positions that were available and I would go on like global Craigslist, like not just my local, search illustration, illustrator, comic, 
design, whatever, and I would blast an email to every single one. Learning to deal with rejection is like the most important thing when you are a professional artist because you're gonna get rejected for all kinds of things and a lot of the time it has nothing to do with your actual quality as a creator, but it is really hard not to take it personally. I mean, I still take things personally to this day. For every 10 emails I was sending out back then, I would get like one reply and then for every like 50, I would get a job. Now the most important job that I got through doing this was that I got connected to a comic writer over in Toronto whose name is Joey and he was writing a bunch of short stories and hiring independent artists to complete the work on commission. We collaborated on a short story called The Builder. Uh, I think I was paid $50 a page, Canadian, <laughs> which was actually pretty good, honestly, in hindsight. But more so, the value in getting to know Joey, I didn't even know. I didn't even know the value that was yet to come. But before we jump into the next era, I'm gonna leave you with two more pieces of advice from this time of my life. The first one is I just wanna underline how important it is to put yourself out there, whether that's telling everyone that you know that you're an illustrator looking for work, whether that's camping out in public areas and getting attention by doing something performative, whether that's sending dozens and dozens of cold emails to people who are hiring. These days you can do things like making sure that your social media is really up to date and you're constantly posting. You can look for work callouts on Twitter. Maybe there's like Discord communities where you can tastefully advertise what you're doing. Reddit, I don't know. Basically at this point in my life, the way that I was approaching building my business was that I had a very clear goal in mind and that goal was to make a living doing art. I just wanna stress how I think that clear goals are really important, especially when you're early in your career. You wanna set a goal that actually has a tangible completion like making a living doing art. Like I was making like 18 grand a year, but I was living off of it and I was doing art by the time that this next phase started, not the last phase. The last phase I was making 20 grand a year serving coffee, but the next phase. Okay, so now I'm a full-time artist and let me tell you how I reached that goal. Saying yes, saying yes to everything. That's why sending all those weird cold emails to all of these different positions that may or may not have been something that I was super interested in pursuing was part of being able to get to that point where I was working full time. And I definitely said yes to some stuff that in hindsight I probably shouldn't have done or like even projects that fell apart because I just wasn't the right person for the job but I was able to smile and charm my way into the position. The biggest thing that allowed me to do this was that uh, through my Craigslist emailing, I managed to get a position as a junior artist for a startup video game company. I didn't really know what the job was exactly, but I realized early on that I was going to have to learn how to 3D model and I was going to have to learn how to texture paint. These were two skills I didn't have at all. I mean, texture painting, you know, it, it transfers from digital painting, but as you can see, these are these weird, I even forget what they're called. They're like skins and they're like unwrapped versions of the 3D models and then you paint on them. And I think I did this for like nine months with this company. Um, I was being paid a salary kind of, I think it was like a daily salary or something like that. The whole company left a little to be desired. It wasn't being run by someone who totally knew what they were doing, but you know what? That worked out for me now, didn't it? Due to the ongoing nature of that project and the ongoing nature of another project, the combined income of those two was enough for me to be like, I could definitely do this full time for three months and pay all my bills, no problem. And that other job was I was contacted by a company to do a comic for a project that they were working on. And they found me through my presence at the Vancouver Comics Festival here. And my, they had me like on the website as a creator who was there. And they said that they'd found me on the website and reached out to me to be a part of the project. And they knew that I knew how to make comics because I had The Builder, Butterpaws in Caddyland, and I think some other stuff up on my portfolio website. So tip number X, Y, Z, be sure to have the work on your portfolio that you want to be paid to make, if that makes sense. So like, if you wanna make comics, you have to have comic pages in your portfolio that show to a potential client that you can make those comics. So between the two of those, I was able to make a very meager but 
sufficient income. But that didn't mean that I stopped taking other work. A few of the strange things that I had on my plate at this time, I did some work for an ad agency and this was work for hire. And I had gotten this through a recommendation through someone that I met at art school. So we are beginning to realize that connections are the basis of having a sustainable creative career. Keep that in mind. I also did some freelance for a company called Zip Trek. I designed this like weird Sasquatch logo and then I did some other illustrations for them down the line through their creative director, who I think was like some like friends with one of my parents or something like that. There was like a chain of connections. So again, connections, but me having that portfolio that shows that I do know how to deliver a product. I also did this really fun project called Zombie Fight or Flight, which was a card game that was designed to be used in mediation with like therapists or something like that. Oh, I also keep like, like meticulous records of everything I've ever done. I have like what I call the tuna shrine, which is just where I pile up everything I've ever made, anything that I've ever gotten as like a comp for something that I've designed because I can't bear to get rid of it. Like. The box is gonna be huge by the time I'm dead, I swear. And one of the most prestigious things, in my opinion, that I was able to do at this time that I was also grossly unprepared for was I was able to teach a class to kids about how to make comics. I remember making my little slideshows and I would like, it was in the summer, it was at the public library. And I had so much fun trying to like impart my wisdom onto these middle schoolers. I would do it totally different now, but I'm very lucky to have had that opportunity. And I think that I found that through Craigslist as well. I'm pretty sure that it was a kids art program company that was like, we're looking for people to teach art classes. And I sent an email in being like, I make comics. I could teach comics to kids. And they took me up on it. So don't be afraid. Just send an email. It never hurts to ask. At this time, I was also doing personal commissions, but I think that this all bundles into like, you can tell that I'm fumbling around. I'm not really secure in my style. I'm kind of like a, just like a production artist rather than someone with a clear vision, but that's all part of the process, isn't it? And I was still doing conventions as well. I started moving on to produ producing very early merchandise, but I didn't have the capital that I needed to invest into making more exciting products. So I was still hand making the living daylights out of everything and mostly doing fan art, but moving into the next era, that's when things began to change. All right, do you remember the builder? Do you remember dear, dear Joey? Well, between finishing the builder and 2016, 2017, he and I had uh, developed a friendship that was like online and we had a creative, kinship where we'd talk about projects that we were working on and everything. And he came to me and he said, you know, I think I'd like to make a graphic novel. Like, would you be interested in illustrating that for me? And I was like, baby, you got the money? No problem. I'll draw that for you, whatever you want. And it turned out that this graphic novel project was going to be the starting point for kind of what my career is now. So this comic, Good Spirits, was a short graphic novel that we decided to fund via Kickstarter. And in order to drum up interest in the project, Joey, who was an active viewer uh, and moderator of Twitch streams, was like, maybe we could stream it and then I could tell my friends to come and watch you stream and we could talk about the project and try and get people interested in backing it on Kickstarter. And I thought, sure, that sounds like a LARF. And who would have thought that streaming would become basically something that I did for, I think it was a good full year. I would stream, I think three times a week for a couple of hours. And that is where I started to realize the value of social media beyond how I had already been using it. So up until this point, I was still a Tumblr user. That was where my social media world existed. I hadn't quite made it to Instagram at this point. I didn't start taking Instagram seriously as a platform until 28, no, 2017, yes. There's a lot of details here and time is an illusion, let's be real. So through Instagram and streaming, I started to understand what a business as an online artist could look like. Around this time, I was watching creators like Franard and I was learning about what it is to be a freelance illustrator. And as well, I was listening to podcasts about being a entrepreneur and learning the business side of things, taking it from being like, I don't know what I'm doing to I kind of a little bit know what I'm doing. 
So throughout this time, I mean, Good Spirits was funded. We funded the Kickstarter and I was working on my first graphic novel, but I was also extremely focused on content production and leaning into this world of streaming and Instagram. And going back to the idea of setting really concrete goals, the goal that I had for my Instagram was that I wanted somebody to send me something for free in order to plug to my followers. This was just the arbitrary goal that I set. And as it turned out, by the time I had 500 followers, I had already reached that. And I thought, okay, well, time for a new one. It was stickers, by the way, a company sent me some free stickers. It was, it was a big day for me. And through this newfound audience of people who were showing up to watch my comic making streams, to people who were following me on Instagram and looking at my work there, I started to do a lot more experimenting and especially experimenting my own way. And a place like Tumblr, fan art was really the way to get reach and to get seen because people would be sharing stuff that they, you know, that they knew and that's like where the big numbers came from. But over on Instagram, the rules were a little different. And this is like, this is Instagram like 1.0, the nothing like the Instagram that it is today. So again, I'll do my best to give you advice, but take it with a grain of salt because things are different now. Try and apply it, try and apply what I'm saying to the modern rules of the game. But through this experimentation, it allowed me to try new mediums. So this was around the time that I started to use traditional mediums, um, lots of Copic markers mostly. And it was also when I started to learn about the algorithm and engagement, and I started to gamify exactly how to get the most attention, really, and express myself creatively. But let's stay in 2017 for a moment, because at this point, I'm still kind of getting my bearings. I haven't quite gotten to my best social media era. We're still talking like sub, I think it's sub 10,000 followers. I think it was the end of 2017. That's what I hit 10,000 followers, which was a big deal and is actually a really great number, period. And it was mid 2017 through my streaming community that I decided to start a Patreon. And I knew from the start that I wanted to have a sticker club, which I have to this day. And when I started, I think I had 15 people sign up right away because they were waiting for my Twitch community to, to support me there, which was a really great way to feel the excitement. I think a lot of people who start a Patreon or something like that kind of open it with like a hush, like a whisper. They're like, yeah, my Patreon's open. But building hype is such an important part of getting people to get excited about supporting you, whether that's for a shop drop, whether that's for starting a new venture like YouTube or like a webcomic, like you want to build that hype so that when you do open, you already have people waiting to support you through that new venture. And then, yeah, it was able to keep me engaged going forward to continue having fun with Patreon. At this time, I also had a commission tier on my Patreon, but it isn't actually like a super sustainable idea because the tier was like $50 and it was an experimental commission tier, which was good for me and for the person subscribing because I was able to exper do these experimental drawings that I was being paid for and they could get something fun based on the trust that we had that I would like produce something pretty decent for them in return. But it also is impossible to change the, the value of the tier without having the supporter like resubscribe to the new amount. So $50 for me in 2017 was a pretty good deal. But by the time that I ended it in 2020, I was like, $50 is not <laughs> like I can't spend hours on a piece for $50 anymore. At the end of 2017, I went through an extremely major life change. Up until that point, I had been with my um, partner of almost six years. And that was the time that I decided to end that relationship and move on from my with my life. And it was a great decision, but it uh, sent me into quite a bit of turmoil through the end of 2017 and the beginning of 2018. And I actually decided to get a part-time job at this point. Um, I was really lucky to find an amazing part-time job working at a comic book store with my friends. <laughs> and we would like hang out and unpack comics and help people find comics and read comics. It was the best job I've ever had. And while it did sort of feel like a step back from this full-time work that I had been doing for a couple of years, it was really important for me to not have to be constantly worrying about the hustle while I was taking care of myself. So if you do find yourself in a position where you have to take a step back from the grind of being a freelancer and working uh, as a small business owner, like don't feel that that's the end. It 
it could just be a little hiccup. You just do it for as long as you need to. So let's get into 2018. Now, 2018 was kind of my best year. At the beginning of 2018, had 10,000 followers or so, or I had just passed that, or I was just about to pass that. And by the end of that year, I had over 50,000 followers. Again, things have changed since then, but what I was doing was I was playing to the algorithm. I was playing to what people were responding well to, leaning into it. And a lot of that was relatable comics, which still are an amazing way to build a following. If you want followers, just make relatable co comics. Every time I make one still, it gets this massive reach that most of my posts don't see anymore because they're so shareable and that's how you win the algorithm, period. But let me explain that 2018, I was like committed to Instagram. I saw it as a job, a part of my job, and I treated it like a job. I would make content every night to post the next day. I posted every single day when I could, where I could, and it was always new, fresh art. But anyway, it was around mid 2018 that I decided to quit streaming because I was dealing with um, uncomfortable parasocial relationships that were bordering on stalking and harassment. And coupled with what I felt was an overly demanding schedule, like in order to be successful as a streamer, you need to show up every single time that you've scheduled a stream and you need to stream as much as you possibly can. And with my new relationship that had began around this time, I decided to take a step back, retire, and no longer have that weight on my shoulders. Now let's go back to Joey. I think it was mid 2018 that we decided to do, oh no, even it was early 2018, we decided to do another graphic novel together. This one was going to be a horror comic. It was gonna be called Be Haunted and it was actually based on my experience um, with having a social media following and having this kind of like streaming snafu of people being a little bit too demanding of my time and my energy. And we translated that into a graphic novel that we decided to take to Kickstarter again. So I believe we ran the Kickstarter around the middle of that year. We were successful in funding it and that became the project that I was working on and making most of my money from through almost the end of 2019. As well, I was working on some other uh, client work. I don't really remember how exactly I got connected, but I have uh, on and off done work for this video game company locally where they will sometimes have me come in and do sort of grunt graphic design work for hourly pay. And then I, they also commissioned me to do these promotional illustrations and these employee anniversary card illustrations. And that's actually something I still do to this day. And that started back around 2018. I was also doing personal commissions at this time, but I do think that you can see that I'm still finding my style. Like you can see that I have a certain way of drawing people, but my control of color just isn't there. And when it, when I look back at it now, like I'm not, I don't feel that my commissioned work was very strong at this time, but my personal work, that's where my spirit was. I was also doing conventions all through this time period, uh, experimenting with new products. A couple of other gigs that I did during this time, I was a colorist for a comic project. Uh, this was random. I think I found this on a Twitter call out and I decided to apply, or they may have cold messaged me on Twitter where I've never had a ton of followers, just for the record. I've gotten a lot of work through Twitter and I never, up until kind of recently, had a lot of followers. So don't feel like you need to have a lot of followers to get people reaching out to you for cold offers. And I also did some other random stuff that was like either me cold emailing or them cold emailing me through my social media exposure. Now let's skip ahead to May of 2019. It was right before this that I was able to quit the comic shop job because my Patreon was doing really well. I had hit 100 patrons. OMG. I think it was after I hit 50 patrons for my mailing list thing that I stopped hand making my stickers and started to have them produced by a company for me. And then a few months later in August, I switched from the single stickers to the sticker sheets because it occurred to me that it was actually more financially viable to do the sheets because I could get way more stickers on a sheet that I was paying $1.50 for than getting like three 75 cent or $1 stickers printed. And I was like, duh. In 2019, I was like starting to come into myself even more. I was doing a lot of experimenting with traditional mediums. And this was how I found my love of acrylic wash, which as you know, if you've seen any of my other videos is my favorite material to use period. And by the end of that year, Bee Haunted was finished. We were sending it to print and wow, the end of 2019 was sure looking great. 2020 couldn't possibly be any different than 2019, could it? 
Now before we get into the real fun, the real meat of 2020 and 2021, uh, one of the side effects of finishing Be Haunted was I entered into an extreme creative burnout. I was grinding to finish that graphic novel and afterwards it was like the tank was empty. By the end of 2019, my social media following on Instagram had grown from 50k to 80k and stagnated. So this was around the time that the algorithm started to change and posting every day wasn't what it wanted anymore. I don't remember if this was when Reels came out or if that was slightly afterwards, but either way, I was dealing with creative burnout and not seeing the results from social media that I had been used to seeing for the two years prior. So. Where did I go? I went back to the drawing board. All right, the, the whole pandemonium situation, um, I, long story short, I ended up in Ireland for pretty much the entirety of the lockdowns and whatever. And luckily I had work already signed up to go from that point. So I knew I was gonna be employed through the pandemic no matter what happened. So while I really wasn't in a creative space personally, I had work to do. The main thing that I was focused on was my next graphic novel, which is called The Unfinished Corner. This was a project that I was approached to do, I also believe through my Twitter following. The publishing company Vault was starting an imprint for um, middle grade comics called Wonderbound, and they wanted me to team up with this writer to make the comic The Unfinished Corner. We'd hashed out the details the fall beforehand, but I was starting production in 2020, and that was basically what I worked on through like the entire year. I was also doing a little bit of personal commissions. I started taking icon commissions, which would become something that I did a lot of the following year. I also continued to work with the video game company doing these um, anniversary cards and stuff like that. So it's just nice to have like a little bit of steady extra freelance work on top of the large ongoing project that I had. I was also doing some minor influencing because I had this social media following. Um, I don't feel that I'm a very good influencer. I just kind of vibe on Instagram and if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Musin, those little radios, they sent me one for free and they said my referral code, I'd get a kickback for every purchase and I know a bunch of people had purchased it because they told me and I never heard from that company again. I sent like five emails and they never kicked me back. Trust no one, you guys. Now I should go over my Patreon this year in 2020. I was running my Patreon from Ireland, but my friend back here in Canada was receiving all of the product for me, packing it up and shipping it off to all my patrons because the cost was gonna be double for me to do it from Ireland because of the postage. And that is when I started to feel very separated from my work. Um, in a very literal way. Now, don't even get me started on the whole mental health situation about dealing with Corona, but like on top of like feeling the burnout, being literally away from the part of my job that I liked the most, which was the Patreon stuff and spending most of my time working on a project that I really couldn't share because it was an ongoing graphic novel project. We were on the beginning of a downward slump or maybe we were in the middle of a downward slump and I tried to revitalize it through halfway through uh, 2020, I decided to start the print side of my Patreon. So up until that point, I had just been doing stickers and then I moved into sending out prints and packages as well. And I also was able to take advantage of something called print on demand, which is like companies who can make merchandise to order and fulfill it for you. The one that I use is called Printful. I highly recommend it. I'd love to do a video specifically on that sometime, but I used it to run an event called Meow Meowloween during that 2020 October period because I was so sad that Halloween was canceled. Obviously it's my favorite holiday. <laughs> and I wanted to bring that Halloween spirit, did me Halloween. Now it's a thing I do every year. But we made it through 2020 and we thought, oh, 2020, haha, what a bad year. Couldn't get worse. Nope, we were wrong. So as the pandemic continued on into 2021, I was still not having a great time. I finished all of the work on the Unfinished Corner graphic novel, which was such a monumental achievement. This was a year when I did an absolute 
unbelievable amount of uh, icon commissions for people. That became kind of my thing that I was doing through this year. I had so much fun doing it, not gonna lie. I think I ended up doing a ton in 2022 as well. And again, I had some work with uh, the video game company doing more anniversary cards. And I was also doing some freelance comics like this weird one for this tech company of their mascot characters. One more thing that I wanted to mention about this period of time is I was lucky enough to be getting work coming to me. So a lot of the stuff that I was doing freelance was with previous clients, with people who had referred me who were previous clients or directly through social media, whether that was uh, personal commissions or client work. And that's really what you want to aim for. And that's why you want to cultivate really good relationships with everyone that you work with and remain in contact with them after the fact, because you never know when they're going to have a little bit more work for you. A big thing about 2021 is due to my lack of passion and the distance that I was feeling from my Patreon, I had to take another step back, kind of like when I took the comic book shop job. I just realized that I needed to recenter myself and take some of the stress off of my plate in order to remember why I love doing what I do. And so I actually suspended my Patreon from April to August of that year. <laughs> And it was August because that was when I was able to return from Ireland to Canada and kind of establish my bearings and get back on track. I spent the rest of 2021 coming to terms with what I wanted to do going forward, conceptualizing where I wanted to take specifically my Patreon and even my freelance going forward. And I also ran Meowloween number two, which was really fun um, because I got to do a photo shoot with my friends as well. Okay, okay, okay. This is the longest video of all time, but let's talk about the current era. 2021 was so dark and grim and like I didn't know what I was gonna do. And then heading into 2022 and just having a idea and a vision and executing it was so exciting. The main thing that I did was I started to be really specific in my theming. So every month when I chose my new Patreon theme to do my sticker and my print rewards for, I got really into it and that was like everything that I drew was gonna be on that theme that month. And this is a fun little piece of advice that I got from a friend, which is that like creating these series makes it so much easier to make art because you're kind of giving yourself a box in which to play. Rather than having all of the ideas in the world available to you, you're focusing in on something and then you're creating a bunch of work on that focus. I really recommend it. If you struggle with kind of your ideas being all over the place or not really fitting together, try and focus on one thing and start there. And through this technique, I was able to reconnect with my work and remember why I love what I do. I was also lucky that through making these reels, I was able to see a little bit more growth in my Instagram account. By July, I had passed 100,000 followers, woohoo! And uh, ever since then, it started to decay and now I'm at like 99,000. So whatever, honestly, I'm not mad. In 2022, I also did Meowloween 3. I continued to work with the video game company that I work with. I did all kinds of like random freelance stuff, but I'm able to be more discerning these days. I can say no, which is something that I had to learn after saying yes for so long. I started getting back into fairs and conventions and I did a little bit more influencering. One of the main things that I did was I was working with a visual novel kind of app called Dorian and they wanted me to like make this story and make all these characters, but I didn't really realize that what they really wanted was to access my followers. So I think my expectations of my output and their expectations of my output were different. So it didn't last very long, but it was fun while it lasted. I think by this point you can see, I have done a lot of different things <laughs> and the road has not been like this. It's not even been, I, it's been wild, yet I still persist. I'm like a cockroach. You can't kill me if you wanted to. And now here we are in 2023. I'm trying something new with the YouTube. I'm trying to make this my work-life balance era because I've never been very good at finding that or it's like a constant pursuit of what that actually looks like for me. And if I'm honest, I do think that I'm in a little bit of a slump here after the success of 2022, but somehow doing this video and doing all this research has been really um, reinvigorating because I realized that these slumps have happened before. And just because I'm in one doesn't mean it's the end and I can find my way through it. And you know what? I am a caterpillar, I am up in that chrysalis, I am turning into goo, and I'm gonna reform myself into a sick butterfly. 
But oh my god, that's it. That's it. I have been recording this video for like an hour and I feel like a raging narcissist for talking about myself for this long, but hopefully there have been some nuggets of information that you can use to, I don't know, inspire your own journey. I want to get into the final part of the video. This is going to be a q and A. I I have selected a few questions that I got on Instagram that I didn't cover in kind of my preamble up until this point. It wasn't a preamble, let's be real. It's like, if I can edit this down to 30 minutes, I'll be lucky. All right, so Steezy Art asks, how do I keep myself motivated? Money or passion or both? P.S. Love your art. Thank you so much. I think I've kind of emphasized the value of money through my career by talking about how I would take work that wasn't exactly my passion or even my style or genre just to get paid. So that was kind of how I approached things at the beginning. But I would say now it's much more important for me to be motivated by passion. <laughs> Starting my career as an artist on Gaia Online has always framed my relationship with art as commercial. But as I've been getting older, my desire to tap into my inner creative spirit has become stronger. So while it may have started with money, and let me, let me just be clear, I didn't get into art to make money because that's not really a thing. I got into art because I love it, but it's, you know, I, I wanted to live comfortably and I wanted to make a full living off of doing it, which was why I have had to prioritize opportunities to make money over passion throughout the years. But I'm in my, I'm in my passion phase of my career now that I have a stable enough income to do so. Lean Mufti Art asks, is it hard to find a balance between the art that I want to make versus what other people would like slash want? I do understand where this can come from. And I think again, because my art has always been kind of a commercial venture to me, I've never really felt that I am a sellout because the way that I make art is just, I really enjoy sharing it and getting feedback from people and doing what people are excited by. And then also like, if they're not that excited, like whatever, I'm going to do it anyway. So my style and my techniques and my, um, subject matter is 100% driven by the stuff that I want to make. I personally feel that if you are just making the stuff that you're passionate about, like you're much better off doing that and attracting a smaller number of people who are interested in that than by selling out by like, I could have been making um, relatable comics for all these years and I probably have a million followers, but that's not who I am as an artist. So I didn't make that call. Kia Pickering Art, love that everyone has art in their username, by the way, says, have I ever wanted an agent? If yes, how did it go and why? If not, why? So uh, I have never really needed an agent because I've had work come to me pretty steady over the years or I'm able to get it through um, my own outreach. But once the unfinished corner was finished, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do next with my career. I was feeling kind of burnt out on comics and was like, maybe I'll just not make comics for a little while. So I did look into getting an agent. I applied to three agencies um, and I didn't hear back from them. And I was like, never mind, I changed my mind. <laughs> so. I haven't looked into it seriously. I think I probably will in the future, but um, not until I feel like it's necessary. And I think if you are in a position where you don't have any social media outreach or following whatsoever, you are not comfortable uh, cold emailing clients and you're not getting any you know, emails in your inbox, like that is a great option as, as far as I know from the people who do work with agents. Um, and it also can take some of the pressure away because as a small business owner, you are the only person you're doing everything, right? Like you're not only like monitoring your inbox, but you're like making the work. You're like, it's, it's a huge job. And so being able to outsource some of that to someone, um, can be like life-saving. Fabian L photography asks, what is the best art slash business advice I've received or have for aspiring artists? The one thing that I want to share with you guys at this moment is Finish your art, it doesn't have to be perfect. Finished, not perfect. Approach every single piece of art that you make this way and your body of work is going to explode. Like I have this like mental like theory where 
you only have so many burners on the stove and if you're not finishing things and you're constantly putting them on back burners those back burners are going to pile up and it's like this mental load that always exists you want to finish that stuff so you can purge it and clean up the stove top and get on with the next good thing like post it online and say all right i'm not going to touch it anymore whatever it looks like for you do that <laughs> but my personal piece of advice is something that I've picked up over my years and this might sound counterintuitive because I've just explained how I did exactly this thing for the last 10 years don't monetize your hobby too soon so like I said I've been monetizing my work since I started making it when I was 14 years old and I do think that it stunted me in terms of my creative growth I had to do a lot of that growing while also relying on making art for income. So if you can, before you decide to take commissions, before you decide to take client work, before you decide to maybe even post online, but I would just post your journey period because I don't think it, I don't think it hurts. It's fun to have a record. I literally went through 15 years of like accounts on other websites to find all of this stuff that I've been showing you all this time. But take time to explore your creativity, Try new mediums, try new subjects, try new styles, because once you commit and start advertising your work for sale, it becomes a lot more difficult to find the time to explore those things. One last question for today. Danig Draw asks, what is the biggest surprise I've gotten on my journey? Do you remember that I mentioned earlier in the video that I ran a comics class for middle schoolers in 2015? Well, this past winter, I was doing a craft fair in my hometown and someone comes up to me there. They look to be like maybe in their early 20s and they say, hey, did you teach a comics class at the public library like 10 years ago? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and they were like, oh, my God, I was in that class. And by being a student of you, you encouraged me to keep making comics and I still make them to this day. And they pulled up their phone and they showed me the comics that they were making. And I was like, yo, I never expected to see any of those kids again. Why would I? I wouldn't, it hadn't even occurred to me that a 13 year old in 2015 is now in their early 20s. But it's really amazing. Like these kinds of impacts are the things that keep me doing what I do. Like when I reflect on what gives me the most satisfaction about my job, it's not accolades. It's not having a book published in a bookstore. It's all the messages that I get from people explaining how my sharing of what I do has encouraged them to do their own thing with art. It can be frustrating being self-employed and being a public artist figure, whether that's like the algorithm or looking for work or getting rude comments on what I do. Having people reach out to me and tell me how I've impacted them is like, it's worth a thousand terrible comments. So that's where I want to leave you guys with this video. This is who I am. I'm Tuna. I'm here now. I have been up. I have been down and you can do it too. I don't see any reason why you can't do it as well. I'm not the best artist, but I have resilience and I've made it all this way. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to me here on YouTube. I am building up this community. I am having so much fun sharing what I do with you through this totally new lens. Actually, it's it's not that new. I got this lens in 2020, so. <laughs> you can also pop on over to that Patreon I've been talking about and support me there. It means the world to me. There is all kinds of extra fun stuff. If you want mailables, I have stickers, prints, always on a new theme every month. But I also have all kinds of behind the scenes content like sketchbook flip through videos, monthly podcasts, just like this video. You can listen to me talk for 45 minutes straight. And I even have a food blog, so be sure to go check it out. There's a link below. Okay. Hey guys, that's it. That's the video. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next week. Bye bye. Goodbye.